Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar, Does Truth Still Matter? A historical Examination of Disinformation and Its Consequences. I'm your moderator. My name is Patrick Ettinger. I'm a professor of history at Sacramento State University. This webinar is part of an ongoing series of um, webinars and talks that the History Department has sponsored uh, called Historical Perspectives on America in Crisis. And over, I think, at least the last four years, scholars from the History Department uh, have been participating in these regular panel discussions, trying to put contemporary events into historical perspective. Um, over the course of the last uh, several years, we've had, um, I'm not sure how many we've had, but we've addressed all kinds of topics from uh, putting the Me Too movement into the context of uh, women's uh, rights, uh, the rise of fascism, we've addressed immigration policy, and a host of other contemporary issues through the lens of history. So this panel today just continues that tradition. I'm pleased to say that today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Project for an Informed Electorate which is a nonpartisan voter information organization directed by uh, one of our panelists today, Dr. Kim Nalder. And we're really uh, pleased to have uh, their, their co-sponsorship today. I have a few housekeeping announcements uh, or about Zoom etiquette and how this is gonna run, and then we'll get going. Um, first of all, I'd like to let you know that the next uh, one of these, um, discussion, uh, webinars, excuse me, uh, takes place on April 16th. So mark your calendar and that's gonna be a very important historical examination of inequalities in health and healthcare in America. So again, a very uh, pertinent topic, <clears throat> uh, pertinent before the uh, pandemic and even more so since. Uh, and that's gonna be a very, very uh, exciting uh, webinar as well. So I hope you will join us for that. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Mona Siegel, my colleague, who is kind of behind the scenes producing in, uh, this uh, series of webinars, and it wouldn't be happening without her. So thank you very much, Dr. Siegel. So here's the timing for today. Uh, today's uh, panel is scheduled to run until 1.30 for about an hour and a half. The panelists and I will be speaking for roughly the first hour. Um, and then we will turn our attention to you and the questions that you have for the panelists. Everyone should see, if you go down to the Zoom tab and see your Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, at any time during the webinar, please enter any questions you have for any of our panelists. Um, our history graduate student, Karita Motes, will be collecting questions throughout the presentation and we'll read them aloud to the panelists when we reach the Q&A session after about an hour. And you can do that anonymously if you want, or you can have your name read as well. But do uh, submit your questions at any time, you know, as they occur to you. It's not like when uh, this is face-to-face uh, -face and you have to wait till the end to ask your question. If a question occurs to you, put it in the Q&A, and Karita will try and get to it. Um, finally, as our housekeeping here, as the sponsor of the event, uh, the history department by tradition wishes to acknowledge that our university stands on still unceded Nisenan land. Uh, we also acknowledge the sovereign tribes in the Sacramento region, the foothills and the southern Maidu people to the north, the Valley Miwok and the Miwok people to the east, and the Potwin, Wintun and Wintu people in the south and west. So now at this point, I'd like to invite today's panelists to uh, join me on the screen. Thank you all, thank you for being here. I'm going to, before I introduce our esteemed panel, let me just uh, say a word or two about why we are here. I doubt that anybody really needs much of an explanation of the origins of this panel, but let me just do that briefly. Um, in early December, as the powerful and a very dangerous effort to deny and overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election was in full swing, our department had one of its regular department meetings. And at that meeting, we agreed that we should address the topic of political 
this information at our next panel in the, in the spring. The importance of today's panel became even clearer, of course, on January 6th. Uh, the violent uh, insurrection on January 6th at the US Capitol revealed the spectacular power of a constant drumbeat of lies and political disinformation. You don't need to be a trained historian and you don't need to be a trained political scientist to know that the period of time that you and I are living through has been extraordinarily tumultuous and extraordinarily confusing. But as citizens of the nation, as citizens of the world, we always should remember that we're like those who came before us. We try to make sense of the world we live in, even as many aspects of that world are in motion or are changing. So that's what we're doing here today. We're just putting our minds together to think about one of the aspects of our changing world, the rise of political disinformation. Now, let me introduce uh, the people you see on your screen. Aaron J. Cohen is professor of history at California State University, Sacramento. Uh, he has published on topics related to monuments, art culture, Russian emigration, and the memory of war in the early 20th century, including a monograph on the First World War and the Russian art world called Imagining the Unimaginable. His latest monograph is entitled War Monuments, Public Patriotism and Bereavement in Russia, 1905 to 2015. And his most recent work is a forthcoming article on the commemorative monument building in Putin's Russia. Why so serious? Tragedy and whimsy in late Soviet and post-Soviet Russian monuments. Dr. Cohen, thanks for joining us. Dr. Kim Nalder is a professor of political science at Sac State. She serves as executive director of the Sac State Cal Speaks poll and also directs the nonpartisan voter information organization that I talked about earlier, uh, the Project for an Informed Electorate. And I encourage you to go to their website as I did earlier to check out what, what they're doing. Um, and that focuses on dispelling voter disinformation. Nader is a frequent political commentator and has been interviewed by the BBC, CNN, The Atlantic, and The New York Times. Her research focuses on misinformation, fact checks, and gendered perceptions of candidates. She has, uh, is a busy scholar as well. She has uh, recently co-authored an article out in the Journal of Elections, Political Opinion, or excuse me, Public Opinion and Parties on fact checks and perceptions of candidate honesty. In addition, she has a chapter in the book, One Nation, Two Realities, out by Oxford University Press, and that addresses citizen responses to fact checking. And she also has a forthcoming uh, piece in Oxford Bibliographies on political misinformation. So I think it's safe to say this topic is in her wheelhouse. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, Dr. Nalder. Finally, uh, our third panelist, my colleague, Dr. Joseph Palermo, is a, a professor of history here at California State University, Sacramento. I particularly want to thank Dr. Palermo for joining us because he did so at, at uh, late notice. Uh, earlier panelists, as many of you know, Dr. Chloe Burke uh, had to step aside and Joe very graciously at the last minute said, sure. So I appreciate that. His expertise includes uh, uh, political history, American political history, Robert Kennedy, the 1960s, presidential uh, politics and war powers, um, social movements of the 20th century, the 1980s, and the history of American foreign policy. His most recent book is called The 80s. He has also written two other books, one titled In His Own Right, The Political Odyssey of Senator Robert F. Kennedy, and a second book, Robert F. Kennedy and the Death of American Idealism. Professor Palermo's most recent academic article on Robert Kennedy appeared in the companion to John F. Kennedy, which was published in 2014. He has also published essays on the life of Father Daniel Berrigan, on the Watergate scandal, and the resignation of Richard Nixon. So Joe, again, uh, Dr. Palermo, again, thank you for joining us. Um, finally, let me introduce uh, the, the uh, person who will be the facilitator for the last half hour today, the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, Karita Motes 
is currently pursuing an MA in history at California State University, Sacramento. Her interests pertain to the Soviet Union, nationalism in the former Soviet republics, and international relations theory. She graduated with a history degree from UC Berkeley in 2017, where she focused broadly on Eastern Europe. After she graduated from Berkeley, uh, Moat served as a Jesse Unruh Assembly Fellow, uh, where she negotiated legislation to protect victims of sexual harassment. She plans to further her education in a PhD program upon completion of the MA here at Sacramento State. Kriya, thank you very much for joining us today. All right. Well, let's uh, start then with some questions for the panelists. And this is a question I'm going to start off with, directed to each of you in turn. I'm going to start with Dr. Cohen. But what do we mean when we talk about disinformation? Let's start with that. In terms of your research or your teaching, what do you understand by disinformation? Dr. Cohen. Uh, thanks, Patrick. And I, I want to thank you and Mona for organizing the panel and also welcome my fellow panelists and the attendees. Uh, I research and write on Russian public culture in late imperial and Soviet times. And it's very common. I run into this very often in my teaching and also just an ordinary conversation for many people to assume that Putin's Russia is similar to the Soviet Union, especially in this area of public lying and propaganda. But uh, I'm gonna argue today, and that's really my main purpose or my main theme is to emphasize how different contemporary Russia is from the Soviet period and how Putin's Russia is, pro is much more similar to the United States or perhaps the two are similar to each other than, to, than either is to the previous Soviet system, especially regarding this question. So before, I'm just gonna give real brief definitions on how I view this, but before I do that, I wanted to say today when I talk about the Soviet Union, I'm gonna be mostly referencing the late Soviet period, which is the 1960s to the late or mid 1980s. Uh, also, I'm gonna be generalizing pretty broadly due to the time limitations. And uh, because of my research, I focus on my work in my work on producers, right, of culture and not necessarily the reception by audiences, which is very difficult for historians and extremely difficult for Soviet historians. So that's sort of the framework of my comments today. So, uh, so here's my take based on, on this question of definitions based on my knowledge of the Russian and Soviet experience. And it seems to me that modern disinformation is different from conventional Soviet propaganda or conventional public lying as it's practiced, as it was practiced or is practiced in the United States. Uh, to me, uh, propaganda or any a number of terms that you could fit into that uh, broad concept presents an official truth, right? Whether it's actually empirically true or not, it doesn't matter. It, propaganda holds itself out as being true. So public lying in propaganda or in ideology or in similar kinds of discourse is fundamental sta fundamentally stabilizing because it gives an epistemological certainty, even though it's false, <laughs> possibly empirically. So in other words, the idea of truth as a means to know the world is maintained. I see disinformation, which you can understand in many different ways, uh, as especially, especially modern disinformation as it have in social media and television today, it, it usually does not present a truth. I mean, that's not the main point. Its main point is to induce conflict and confusion, right? So it's more akin to gaslighting or uh, the philosophers call it bullshitting where the speaker doesn't care about whether that what they say is actually true, but they're just saying things to destabilize certainty and truth as a concept and a way that we know the wor world, right? So in other words, disinformation uh, promulgators seek to destabilize your sense of what is true 
or that we can even know truth rather than actually try to convince you of some different truth, which is, may or may not actually be true. So the Soviet and the Russian experience helped me understand these two things as being different. Very good, thank, thank you. Um, Dr. Nalder, I'll turn to you next, same question. What do you, what does uh, you understand by disinformation? Thank you. Um, also, thank you to the history department and the organizers and, and everything. Um, so I started studying misinformation about a decade ago and started working on uh, dispelling it or replacing it with good information through the project for an informed electorate. We do things like an initiative explainer where we you know, try to establish the actual facts, even though people are getting barraged with, with false information from TV ads and such. Uh, we do uh, part. We had a partnership this last year with News Ten, where we we dispelled disinformation. Especially, they had a series where they had you know their viewers call in and say like, "I'm I'm hearing that if you use a magic marker on your ballot, then it's invalidated, and people are trying to make you do that." And so we would dispel those things on TV. And we also have had a long series of ad watches with Channel Three, where we look at the truth of ads, and all that's about misinformation trying to establish things that are true and trying to you know, fact check or, or replace content that's not. What's more pernicious is disinformation, which I think of as a subset of misinformation. Misinformation being when people believe things that are not actually accurate. Disinformation being when it's purposely fed to people to meet some sort of political aim. And I think the, the one of the worst manifestations we're seeing of that right now is kind of what, what Aaron was talking about, which is this um, use of disinformation to undermine our sense of truth. And essentially the effect can be that when you meet truth, you won't believe it. And, and that's sort of the most dangerous thing. And I think we're seeing a lot of that today. Uh, and then of course, undermining democracy uh, as part of that, which I'm sure we'll get into plenty of. I'll stop there because we're, we're running out of time already. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Nalder. Uh, finally, Dr. Palermo, your take on what you um, what we mean by disinformation. Well, the way I mean, the way I see it, I, I'll build on both what those good points were made earlier. Um, is it, it doesn't necessarily have to be false information. It could be irrelevant, misleading, misplaced, fra fragmented information um, that gives the the viewer or reader the illusion of knowing something when in reality the disinformation is moving them away from knowing something this is the epistemological point of the social media that that i've, I've been grappling with for well years now um it, it i think it is kind of unique because we're in kind of a post-truth um, era where we have these in other words a, like an example people who believe that um, uh, Trump won the election by a landslide in 2020 they know he won the election it isn't about oh I think he might have won or oh well I read this information and it said you know after 60 courts rejected it, and after even the Republican, you know, election officials are doing hand counts in Georgia and saying, well, it was fine. That doesn't mean anything, because these people know that it was rigged, right? And so how do they know? Well, they know from their micro-targeted social media feeds that are just amplifying their, um, their biases and you know, if, if you click on something that um, like the NRA puts out, you're going to get just nothing but, you know, right wing stuff related to NRA and and they the, the social media companies, you know, they want to keep you engaged. That's really all they care about. And they, the way they keep you engaged is to um, uh, touch the what they call the easy emotions. The easy emotions are anger and fear. And the harder ones are nuance, um, you know, complexity, uh, empathy, right? And so there's a, a been a shift, I believe, in our, I, I, you could call it cultural vocabulary, you could call it discourse, whatever you want to call it. 
but there's been a fundamental shift, I would argue, in the last 10 years that um, has led to this bifurcated kind of um, polarized, and it doesn't, you know, political environment we have, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this is determinative or something, right? I'm just, it, it goes along with the gilded age levels of wealth and income inequality. It goes along with the polarization among uh, cultural battles, right? And the white grievance after eight years of the Obama presidency. And so there's a lot to it. There's racism and these, but it's really rampant. I, it, it, you know, if you go in some of these platforms, um, you well, won't maybe, maybe we'll get to that in a second, yeah, Joe. Okay, I, want okay. to, I want to just uh, start, start it off with just uh, defining the term disinformation, but I'm going to stick with you for a second. So, because uh, I'm going to turn to, um, with the next question to our two historians and ask them, you know, with an eye on the present moment and the last couple of national elections, right? Um, I, I'd like to, to think about it historically. We're going to talk about the present, but we want to think about it a little bit historically. Have Paul, and so this question for Aaron first and then, or Dr. Cohen first and then Dr. Palermo, have politicians or other public actors um, deliberately stoked big lies for political gain at key moments in the past, at home or abroad? So what, what you know, I, I take your point, Joe, that, um, uh, that uh, much is new, but this question is, what's, what are some precedents that are worth even considering in the past? Dr. Cohen? Okay, thank you. So the Soviet Union from the very beginning uh, was officially a propaganda state, right? Which to them meant something different to, to most of us. Uh, that meant that Soviet leaders understood uh, that propaganda was intended to propagate Bolshevik and Soviet ideas to the masses. And Soviet public culture was therefore always presented or, or always attempted to present truths to convince people, right, of the reality of that situation in the Soviet Union. And even when those truths were empirically false or disputed. So it, it, throughout the entire Soviet period, you could see it sort of as an official truth. There was an official truth, a way of seeing reality that was supported by, uh, this gets a little bit technical, a totalizing non-pluralistic public culture. And the important thing is that that was not just enforced via an impressive system. Right, the Soviet state controlled all the access points to public space. So in that sense, it did not have to coerce public expression. Alternatives that existed, but they could not exist in the public. They were never ever able to, well, never ever. They were never able to enter the public. And the second asked, so public lying was rife in the Soviet Union, but obviously it was the Soviet truth and the Soviet reality, which people outside the Soviet Union often pointed out. The second thing that Soviet uh, public uh, discourse and presentation did was that it signaled power, right? That is, the Bolsheviks are in power and you are not if you're not Bolshevik. Uh, and as such, the early Bolshevik state in the 1920s was an innovator in what we would call branding. That is, the Bolsheviks wanted to implement the idea that the revolution was reality, that it was success successful, and that they were in charge throughout material and popular culture. And that's because their actual Marxist propaganda and ideology was more or less incomprehensible <laughs> to almost everybody, including myself and many students. Uh, so the system was set up to narrate an official truth of Soviet reality and to signal Soviet control over society. And it failed by the late Soviet period. And it probably was failing earlier because people did not believe that official truth and they even didn't pay attention to it. Disinformation, as we understand, have been talking about it uh, the word actually classically comes from co Soviet Cold War spycraft, which was aimed at its adversaries, right? And Soviet dis disinformation in the Cold War was intended to de destabilize Western spy agencies and uh, US and American political structures, you know, broadly speaking, right? Not really to convince them that Soviet pro ideas were correct, 
just to confuse and distract and um, meddle, as we would say these days, into like internal domestic affairs, as well as just spot, classic spying. So the Soviet Union at that time didn't, because of its uh, media system and its monopolization of public knowledge, it didn't really care what the US said in public, right? Because it could completely control expressions of ideas and in, in public discourse. Oh, good. Very good. Um, let me turn that uh, question to you, uh, Dr. Palermo. Is there a moment in U.S. history, you teach American political history, is there a moment in U U.S. history, 20th century, or when, when what we are calling disinformation played a really significant role? Yeah, you know, I, I, what comes to mind in, in the American context is in the 30s, you know, um, when radio was still new, this, this Detroit uh, right wing priest kind of hijacked the medium and he had an audience of millions, Charles Coughlin, and he was just uh, railing against the New Deal, um, vicious anti Semitic stuff he was saying uh, on the air. And so he was spreading a lot of lies about the New Deal in the 30s on the new medium of radio. Joe McCarthy in the 50s, right, early 50s, he had this Senate committee that he could. Um, hold hearings and make them very dramatic and kind of, um, you know, good for TV. And when TV was new, relatively new, there were these televised hearings where he ended up ruining the careers of thousands of people and um, accusing everybody of, of being communists and blacklisting Hollywood, you know, directors and screenwriters, et cetera. And um, all that was going on in uh, again, the big lie at that time was that the United States national security was threatened by an internal communist infiltration, which which is laughable uh, looking back on it. Um, it wasn't a witch hunt. There were communists, but it was basically anybody who dabbled in, in uh, left wing politics in the 1930s would get their name dragged through the mud in the 50s. Anyway, so but but that was based on a big lie. You had the John Birch Society after that, and they had a big international cabal that they thought controlled the, the government and the world. And, and they're also anti-Semitic, actually, the John Birchers and racist and anti-immigrant, all that right wing great stuff that we know so well. And um, but in a funda way, fundamental way, I would say that they were. Um, they have more in common with the earlier part of the 20th century than we do now. Uh, in that those they still relied on newsletters in person meetings radio shows television you know this kind of thing uh, there's a guy george uh, lincoln rockwell who was kind of a nazi cosplay guy you know that <laughs> they would march around with the swastikas and the whole deal in, in the 50s and um but they didn't have a lot of traction because it's hard to organize a nazi rally or a kkk rally back then because you had to put a flyer up and say meet us at this time and place and now you know with the beauty of social media it's so wonderful all the nazis and klansmen and anti-semites and bigots and misogynists and you name it they all found each other on the on this miracle of the web and isn't that a beautiful thing <laughs> sorry but it but their discourse then was nothing like the fragmented machine learning algorithmic fragmentation that we have now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, those are um, excellent sort of reminders of, of past patterns of this. Um, since you brought up technology, that's what I wanted to ask about next. And since you've already addressed it, maybe I'll just see if uh, Dr. Cohen or Dr. Nalder have anything to say. I, I, I think we'd all agree that technological changes are the, if not, you know, are the principal factor that's created this new world of information and disinformation that we're all inhabiting. We're all trying to make sense of it. It's driven by technology. I wonder if either of you uh, also see any useful sort of precedents of thinking about uh, how technological change, um, uh, how, how previous generations kind of struggled with that. I'm thinking among other things about the advent of direct mail campaigning in the 70s and 80s, for example, of, of, of the, the ability that that allowed people to get messages across. So I guess the question is, you know, it, it, have past societies coped with new technologies to spread disinformation in a way that's, that's useful for us? Or are we going through a period right now of such change of form or magnitude that 
it's hard to find a, a good comparison to new technologies. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Nalder. Thank you. Um, well, you know, since mass media came on the scene with radio, you know, early radio, people were very concerned that there'd be manipulation and, and brainwashing. But the big difference is that uh, up until the internet, it was top down and there were gatekeepers and there were means of limiting uh, the exposure to information. It wasn't lateral like it is now. And, you know, one of the things that really concerns me with disinformation today is that people will say, well, do your own research. I did my own research and I ended up with a bunch of QAnon content and went down that rabbit hole. And because of the algorithms, you know, it, what, what you think of as just finding more information can result in you finding more disinformation and be getting further and further from the truth. And then, you know, just the capacity now to be in these, you know, we divided audiences, right, where we can just consume information that confirms our already previously held beliefs um, makes it such that we can get lost in it um, and never be exposed to counter information. So even if the true information is out there, if journalists are doing a great job, we don't have access to it if we're just exposing ourselves to this content that, that, that is not true. Uh, I'll move on. Dr. Cohen, any thoughts on that question? Well, yes, brief thoughts. Uh, of course, the Soviet system was always able to take up any techno technological changes because it controlled the public. So film, print, television, didn't even, it didn't matter. Uh, the effect was the same. So there is real no analog to, uh, in the Soviet experience. And you actually find that the Soviet system weakens in the late 1980s because the Soviet authorities under Gorbachev allowed various different viewpoints in the print media, especially, right? And this helped discredit the Soviet system and contribute to the end of the, so of the uh, USSR. But the contemporary Russian political system is, uh, is built much more in structural way, similar to the United States and Europe in that it's, uh, it, even though it has many more authoritarian characteristics, it do ha does have a pluralist public, the internet functions, right? And the government and the elites need to use that technology and have learned to use it very effectively. In other words, they can't go back to the Soviet era anymore. And I think the uh, other point is that they don't need to because they live in the modern era, right? So. The old Soviet system is just anachronistic and uh, they're well positioned to take advantage of the kinds of things that Kim was talking about uh, that exist in the, our country and other countries. Excellent. Um, in the last uh, decade or so, I realized I really needed to pay much better attention when I was being taught about algorithms um, in uh, high school and college because we've come to discover how incredibly important they are in our uh, political life. Um, Dr. Nalder, let me uh, stay with you for a second here and ask you this question. Um, and here I'm kind of interested in what kind of research or what, what, what we know about the um, reception of disinformation. Um, we hear, we've, we've spoken a little bit here today about the sources of different disinformation. And I'm thinking particularly of the last couple of um, elections and social media. But are there any patterns as to which sorts of people most often fall prey to disinformation? Yeah, there are. So we, we used to think, and, and this is not disproven, but we used to think that it was um, people who are socially isolated, loners, you know, the sort of guy living in his parents' basement, um, listening to conspiracy theory radio or, you know, something like that. And that that is still the case that, that social isolation can lead to it. But what we're seeing more commonly today is, is sort of the flip side of that, which is that people searching for community and social connection and a connection to a group are attracted to a lot of this disinformation because especially I think during the pandemic, it feeds this. So, you know, a lot of people are, are away from regular contact at work or regular contact with friends and family that they used to be. But what they can do is, is connect with people online. And the, you know, especially the Q and I keep going back to QAnon, but it's one of the you know most pernicious ones. Um, you know, like the example of QAnon, people uh, start to sort of solve the puzzles. So they're, you know, it's set up as, as you need to find more information. It's, it's hints and clues. And then you end up connecting with under, other individuals who are on this quest with you. So it has almost a video game 
aspect to it. And so people who are attracted to puzzles and to um, you know finding out their own information. So ironically, it's people in many cases who are more informed, who are intelligent, who pay attention to politics, who are more likely to to fall prey to this. It's, you know, I think the popular imagination is that it's the opposite of that, that it's, you know, people who don't know much and, and can be suckered, but it's actually not usually that. It's people who are, in many cases, actually attracted to the idea of being crusaders for doing the right thing. You know, if you think about the, the attacks on the 6th, they didn't think they were destroying democracy. They, they thought they were protecting democracy because they bought into the, to the big lie. And, and many people are, are attracted to this idea of a, a mission that's bigger than yourself and, and doing something for your country. And you know, just unfortunately, it's channeled in the wrong way through this active disinformation campaigning. That's very helpful. Um, uh, Dr. Palermo, given the disinformation about the election results that uh, was coming out of the White House and coming out of uh, related media outlets. Did the January 6th insurrection, uh, did that take you by surprise? It did actually, because, um, you know, I've been there and, and I, I've, I, it sounds corny. I was watching C-SPAN at the time because they were doing the certification and, um, and I saw this commotion and then the C-SPAN cameras just went down. I thought, this is strange. And then I went onto the networks and stuff, but, um, it's corny, but I was really in awe of that whole place when I was there as a temple of democracy, which again is, you know, um, it's kind of like a temple to secular democracy. It's really amazing place. And um, to see this guy waving a giant Confederate flag in the rotunda was something that, wow, you know, I, I didn't think that I, I, I assume that even though Trump was having his Nuremberg rally down the street, that um, the capital, right, would be secure because it's the capital of the United States of America, right? And, and there's a lot of sketchy stuff that's coming out in dribs and drabs right now about how uh, coordinated uh, and conscious, there was some conscious effort on the part of some people in the Trump regime that purposely held back the National Guard. The, the, the head of the guard, the DC guard just testified in to Congress about that. So it's very unusual that he had to wait two and a half hours to deploy when he was ready to go in a minute, right? And so Trump was still in power and he still had his handpicked lackey as the defense secretary, acting defense secretary. And um, the whole thing is, is sketchy, but it's also um, kind of like, the way it was coordinated with the Proud Boys being there and the Oath Keepers. And there was some very serious kind of, I mean, a Capitol Police officer was killed and we still don't know really what, um, you know, what the circumstances are around that killing. Now that's a big deal. Now you tell me, I'll ask a, a rhetorical question. If a democratic president who had just lost an election by 8 million votes, had a giant rally with Black Lives Matter protesters and then sent them down to the Capitol and they broke in the Capitol and they killed a cop. You tell me how this country would react. Now, a lot of these questions, how do these guys do this? How do they do? Well, white privilege has a lot to do with it because they're going, oh, these, these, are, these guys are okay, right? Oh, they're, you know, oh, they'll come in. I'm telling you, if those protesters were African-American or uh, people, minorities of any kind, they, they, they never would have gotten into the Capitol under any circumstances. And so, and there's also uh, in, indications that they're, in, they're investigating now that there were, was communication between some of these wacko Republican uh, new freshman uh, Congress people like Lauren Bulbert, Bulbert from Colorado and our great friend from QAnon, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, from Georgia, that maybe they were actually in contact with, with some of these people and kind of uh, helping them uh, come in and do that. Now, what I find, one, I'll just make one last point. What I find interesting is these guys, they're, they're talking about the boogaloo, which is a race war. They're talking about, we're going we're gonna to kidnap Governor 
Whitmer and Michigan, you know, we're going to do all, they're all, oh, they're all so tough and big and proud boys and street fighters. And then as soon as they get popped by the federal government and they get charged with felonies, all of a sudden they turn in these whining little babies about it. So the whole thing is kind of a, a I don't know, it is an internet driven, social media driven, there's a lot of, um, uh, but again, they would not have been there if it weren't for the disinformation that that they said Trump law Trump won the election. Right. They're still saying it. And we uh, will look forward to learning more uh, from political historians, hopefully, and others about what was really going on in the Capitol that day, what kind of communication was going on. Um, uh, just quickly, I don't know if uh, Dr. Cohen or Dr. Nalder had a similar reaction to that question of just was this was uh, were you taken by surprise by that uh, invasion of the Capitol? Um, Dr. Nalder? I feel like I, almost like I was less taken by surprise than apparently the FBI was, you know, like they didn't they didn't prepare uh, to defend the Capitol. It, it was foreseeable that something like that might happen. Um, there was certainly messaging that was encouraging violence. I mean, I think they're, they're used to observing these internet channels and seeing a lot of big talk that doesn't turn into anything. So, you know, that may be part of it, but the, the disinformation was out there. And, it, and if you think about it, the big lie about the election being stolen, that, that he won in a landslide and the Democrats undermined all that. The Democrats who are baby eating pedophile, like it's just bizarre land. But but if you truly believed that, of course you would take up arms. I mean, you do anything. And so I guess in that sense, it wasn't surprising when you understand that people truly believe this, this insane disinformation. Um, let me go back to Dr. Cohen with a, a different question. Um, if that's okay, which is going back to the election in 2016. Can you help us understand how post-Soviet Russia came to play such an important role in the 2016 election? I can, in fact, do that. Uh, and uh, the, the main thing that you have to know about this question is that the Russian meddling in U.S. elections emerges from the domestic Russian political situation it's not part of an actual strategic plan for any kind of domination of the world or of Europe or anything. It doesn't seem to be leaked to any specific goals strategically or internationally. And the way that I approach this question, which is like uh, not very scholarly, is that it, you, you kind of, it helps me to see Putin's Russia as kind of a troll nation as long as we're talking about uh, internet memes and internet concepts in, in which it's important where it's important to show strength uh, and those public shows of strength and of international meddling and the masculinist culture that's promoted in Russia basically covers up perceived inadequacies and weaknesses right so uh, in a sense Putin's Russia is a lot like Trump's America in which it's it's important to have a performative display of, of dominance politics, right, in the country and to mobilize like-minded people, right? But that's the basic point of that is to hide basic feelings of inadequacy or fears we've been talking about. It's not to like achieve some foreign policy goal, mainly. So uh, the perceived grievances of Russian people uh, in Russia is uh, basically manipulated by the a government in Russia in a very similar way that we've been talking about in this country, right? Uh, to sort of cover up both the failures of the Putin government, particularly the failure to turn Russia from a middle income country into a high income country. And, and, to, uh, and, to, uh, and so they provoke, international bad mouthing of Russia, they uh, support, they use world events and um, uh, policies to maintain sort of a popular Russian grievance culture in Russia that's very similar to the white grievance politics that uh, Joe Palermo was talking about. And there's lots of specific cases which I could go into about this, but I think there's no time. Uh, so I won't, but I'll just say that the very real Russian meddling is classic disinformation in the way that the Soviets practice. They designed to destabilize 
the United States, uh, and it has no real strategic goal. Like if they were the dog catching the car, they wouldn't know what happened, right? The main point is that the US looks bad, bad. Putin believes this shows Russian strength. The Putin elite seeks to identify themselves with Russia and showing a strong Russia. Russia shows how strong they are. And so this Russian meddling goes far beyond traditional spying, although there is some of that involved. It, it includes spectacular assassinations and computer hacking, whataboutism, false victimization, uh, disinformation, of which, as we've been talking about, uh, mostly for a domestic audience, I would say. And that's why the, the spectacular lies of the Putin government regarding, you know, some of this poisonings and stuff, everybody knows is wrong. It doesn't matter. The idea is just to stoke anti-Russian uh, feeling with the idea of negating that inside of Russia. I'm not sure if I explained that very well, but I think that's enough talking on my part at this, at this moment. I think that was great, actually. Um... So that's it's just going to continue, right? as long as the Putin government's there. All right. Dr. Nalder, another question for you. You mentioned earlier um, gatekeepers and flow of information from the top down versus bottom up. And, and uh, for the, as long as we've had the internet now, we've seen that uh, erosion of those traditional authorities controlling the flow of information. And I wanted to ask you in particular, and I, I know we're getting a lot of great questions in the Q&A right now, but I know one of them is going to be about um, the decline of traditional journalism and uh, whether it's print or television as a source of information. So the question is, what, what role did journalists play in perpetuating or countering disinformation before the Internet age? And, and what role do you see them playing today? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so if you think about, you know, the mid 20th century to the late 20th century, but especially earlier on, you had, you know, three major networks that had a news program in the evening. You had major newspapers that that came out in a print edition once a day, and so journalists had a one a day deadline, and that gave them the time to, and plus journalistic ethics expected it, that gave them the time to fact check before they put stories out. So they would verify their sources. Again, it's the journalistic ethics, right? You verify, you get multiple sources, you verify those sources. And so just false information didn't get released into the public in the same way because just mostly, well, because of the ethics, but also because of the, you know, one a day deadline thing. Um, the, the, the bottom line pressures didn't force them to put out stories that were untrue or that were speculation or that kind of thing earlier. And, you know, as far as journalists today, uh, I, I still think it's their responsibility to put out credible information. We need to be able to point people when we do media literacy and, you know, which many of us are, are, are really ramping up. It, we're seeing it ramping up around the country and, and even being taught in high schools to an increasing degree, luckily. But in teaching media literacy, we don't need to just feed the cynicism. <laughs> which is what ends up happening a lot is that, you know, everything's false and look out, they're trying to get you. But we also need to be able to point people to actual good information, to content that will be reliable and relatively trustworthy with, within parameters, obviously, they're not perfect, but we need them to be doing that. And then just as a subset, um, repeating the false information and doing corrections can make it worse. And so anytime they're doing fact checking, they should repeat the correct information first, then talk about the incorrect, and then, and then re, once again, reemphasize what's actually true. So if you just take away the false information and don't replace it with something, it's not very effective. And I don't know that journalists necessarily are conscious of that when, even when they're trying to fact check. And then of course there's, there's purposeful, there's also media outlets, of course, that are purposefully uh, feeding misinformation or disinformation and you know the big lie obviously got stoked on on fox news and all kinds of other uh, online outlets and other media outlets oan and, and so forth and so you know that's obviously another thing to to uh, to grapple with and to uh, try to control i mean i guess i'm getting ahead a little bit but maybe you know the suit the defamation suits against some of these organizations from the um voting 
uh, company companies, uh, that may be a bigger deterrent than all of these things that we've been working on for years, right? Because it's a bottom line pressure. So maybe answers in the courts and 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 with the law too. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I think I'm not alone in noticing that some media outlets were rather slow, but have eventually gotten to the point where they are now calling in their articles uh, an unsubstantiated untruth, and they will just say that it is untrue, and then they will uh, put that. So that's showing up more in articles I've noticed, political uh, coverage in particular. I think that's it also- That's actually what I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please. That's actually what I'm doing research on right now is, uh, the phrasing that they use when they talk about false information. Do they refer to it as a lie? Do they refer to it as unsubstantiated or without evidence? And which of those are actually most effective? Interesting. Um, a lot of it has to do with the monetary basis of, of all these operations too, whereas print journalism used to get, you know, a lot of its revenue through advertising and now it's, it's a, a universe of clickbait where uh, it's a different, uh, entirely different revenue stream. Well, as we're closing out uh, a portion of us talking here today, we've we've looked backwards. We've talked a little bit about the present. So let's look ahead a little bit and uh, have questions for all of you about what that future, what we can take from the past or uh, for that future. Um, and uh, Dr. Cohen, going back to the Soviet uh, period that you studied, um, how did Soviet citizens who lived in the state governed by a single party that controlled the media, how did they counter state propagated disinformation? Uh, well, they did it in many ways, right? And in essence, the Soviet system uh, that presented Soviet reality failed because it could not keep people's attention. And uh, it caused people to seek non-Soviet truth or to disbelieve the Soviet truth, right? So a small number of people found alternative truths outside of the official sphere, official public. Uh, these were often artists or intellectuals. Um, they founded their own underground journals and things like that. Some people listened to foreign radio broadcasts like the BBC or Radio Liberty, again, seeking for a different truth. But to be honest, most people just turned off official media did not pay attention, separated themselves from official discourse. Many of them became cynical. Uh, they mistrusted any official presentation, even when it was true. Uh, and almost everybody, and this is something that Americans find difficult to understand often about the Soviet experience, almost everybody, including people in power, engaged in code switching, which was speaking the correct language in public, especially to people who you don't know. And so people would be talking Soviet language to each other with neither of them really believing it. It was just sort of what you had to do and they didn't care about it. So the result of all this was really disengagement and you could say kind of a widespread cynicism against the government. It actually did the opposite of what the government wanted, right? <laughs> which to convince people that Soviet reality is true, people automatically discounted everything and pretty much ignored it. Uh, and I think, uh, that's why in Putin's Russia, they are not trying to replicate that. They're trying, they try and um, do the things that we've been talking about to maintain popular support. Excellent, thank you. Um, that's a good picture of, of uh, people operating in, in the system uh, uh, overwhelmed with disinformation. Um, Dr. Palermo and Dr. Nalder, uh, a last question for you. It, is widespread disinformation preventable? Is it something that can be mitigated? Um, uh, how are we going to balance kind of, you know, First Amendment speech with uh, disinformation? I think that's a, a big issue. And uh, so I'm going to give you each a chance to solve this entire problem for us. I'll begin with Dr. Palermo. Well, you know, I would say that, <clears throat> you know, a couple of days after the 2016 election, Mark Zuckerberg famously uh, said at some tech conference that the idea that Facebook had anything to do with the outcome of the 2016 election was crazy, a crazy idea. Now he walked that back later, right? But um, talk about not having a clue and not really for the fact that Facebook gave 87 million uh, data people, users, uh, 87, the data for 87 million Facebook users to Cambridge Analytica, 
which was this creepy James Bond villain kind of company that was originally financed by uh, these strange libertarian billionaire types, the Mercers. But he, and there, it was estimated after this 2016 election that 126 million eligible voters on Facebook received or liked or shared disinformation, not only from uh, Russian trolls and the troll factory in St. Petersburg, but also all sorts of bad actors, uh, bots, trolls from Saudi Arabia and from all over, right? And so it, it most certainly did have an effect on the election because um, what, what they did was they, um, anything, they tested out uh, memes and content to see if it would, which ones rose higher. And they were actually able to make things trend using fake accounts and fake groups and make things artificially trend on Twitter or Facebook um, that normally would not. And then the other, the, the last point I would say is that um, probably the most important thing that has happened in the last year, one of the most important is that Twitter banned Donald Trump permanently off that platform. Now, I should have done that a long time ago, I think. But can you imagine if today he still had Twitter right now, how he would be just generating, because he has like over 80 million followers, right? At the time, uh, Trump had 80 million Twitter followers. Joe Biden had 4 million just last Mar March 2020, a year ago. Biden had 4 million. Trump had 80 million. So the fact he's off Twitter and Jack Dorsey finally got off his duff and, and did something, um, I think it's great. That's a good thing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nalder, that, that, that la let you have the last word on that. Um, disinformation preventable? How can we mitigate it? What do you think? Yeah, I'm just going to solve it right now. So <laughs> it'll be done. Uh, so first thing is that it's better to prevent it than to try to roll it back or correct it. And so if we can get media outlets to not put out that information in the first place, that's the best way. Obviously, we can't control all that because of the First Amendment and because of interpretations of the courts of the First Amendment. But another thing that can work is inoculation. When you, uh, and then this is part of media literacy training that we can do with folks. When you tell them the techniques that are used for misinformation or by disinformation. Um, sorry, my dog's barking. I hope we can't hear that too much. Um, so if you, if you say, well, they're going to try to convince you using fear, they're going to try to convince you using uh, appeals to your inner social group and your overlapping group identities, et cetera, then a person starts to develop an immunity because they, they think of counter arguments themselves. So they don't have to be provided those from the outside by a fact checker or something. They start to generate that before they get hit with, with the bigger big lie or before they go down the QAnon conspiracy um, rabbit hole or something like that. Um, and then there's deprogramming. It's kind of similar to how people approach cult members. You know, once somebody's really bought into this cycle of disinformation, um, bringing them back. But the one thing that I think most of us probably have tried is to just say, hey, you're wrong, here's why, and provide factual information. It feels like that should work. And I, I still, I know better, but I still try it, <laughs> but it doesn't work. You know, people just get defensive and they double down and that's never going to be effective. It works better to talk to them about what they believe, why they believe it, talk to them. If, if it's someone you know, someone in your family or your friends, um, ask them about, you know, kind of how's that working for you, right? Like, how is this impacting your life? Especially when people are really immersed in this stuff and it, it, it generates a lot of hate and anger and it, it tends to keep them isolated even some, from their closest family members in many cases. So talking about it in a bigger picture level in terms of how it impacts their lives sometimes can really turn them around. And then I think, you know, just societally, um, the, the defamation suits are useful, the deplatforming is useful. If we could bring something like the fairness doctrine back where media outlets were forced to, to uh, present counter arguments, then we wouldn't have something like a, a Fox News e ecosystem that allows people to just marinate in this disinformation. Well, that's all um, hopeful. That all gives yeah. us some, uh, some path forward and we all, we all need some hope. 
Well, we've reached the one hour mark uh, very quickly. And uh, so now I'm gonna invite uh, Carita Motes to come back on the screen with us here. I notice I, I haven't been able to pay attention to it, but I see a large number down there by the Q&A. So Carita, do you wanna uh, address uh, some of the uh, questions you've received to the panel? Yeah, absolutely. We've received quite the array of fantastic questions. I'm going to direct the first question to Dr. Palermo, and then if Dr. Nalder and Dr. Cohen want to jump in, that would be great. Um, so in terms of election disinformation, are there any specific um, elections or situations throughout the span of US history that are comparable to the right-winged response to the 2020 presidential election? No, it's, it's completely unprecedented. There's never been, even Herbert Hoover, who lost a big to uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, and he despised Roosevelt. They got in the car together and they rode to the inauguration and, and Hoover kind of sat there stony faced through the whole thing. And, but he would never dream, even in 1932, you know, where they, 33, March 4th, 1933, they would, um, he, it was just such, bad, it's such a bad look for the United States internationally to have a president just say, oh, I don't, I'm out. I'm not going to uh, participate in the, the peaceful transfer of power. See, that, that's the thing. Internationally, the attack on the U.S. Capitol was the worst look since the torture stuff in uh, Abu Ghraib prison came out in 04, in my opinion, because it just showed the world that every time the United States tries to lecture a country on what democracy is, it's going to ring hollow now, and as, as well it should, in my opinion. But I think it's inextricably linked to the, the platforms that we've... In other words, Trump is a creature of our current diseased discourse and vocabulary, public vocabulary. And he would not have become president if he didn't have that Twitter platform. He wouldn't have become president if he didn't have The Apprentice, the television show, right? And so we're in this kind of, um, and they still want him to be president. You know, he still has this, even though he's out of power, he still has this kind of, because you have to remember, 139 Republicans voted in the House to decertify the election. And eight senators voted to, Republican senators voted to decertify the election. And so this isn't just Trump. The whole party is kind of, you know, becoming a cult of personality around the guy. And so anyway, that's how I would answer it. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for that thoughtful response. Um, I'll move forward unless anybody else wants to weigh in. Um, so moving forward, we've gotten a lot of questions in the vein of um, what can we do and how do we combat this um, in our own lives, both from students and other professionals. Um, in the classroom, we talk about critical thinking and um, finding logical arguments. Um, so does it still matter that we teach these things? And um, how are we forever stuck in epistemological tribes? Um, I think I'll direct that first to Dr. Nalder. Thank you. Yeah, I saw um, retired professor Nick Burnett uh, put that question out. So he, he has lots of experience with doing this for many years too. And, and sometimes it can feel like, wow, my, is my life's worth work doing anything? Is it worth doing? Um, I, I think it is. There's actually lots of research to show that, you know, like that inoculation that I was talking about can be effective in, in keeping people uh, out of falling into the disinformation in the first place. Um, and the, I mean, what, what I think the piece that's missing, and I saw some people were actually asking this in the questions, is, um, you know, exactly how do we find good information? We have lots of this debunking of the bad information, but not as much provision of uh, content that is good. And I think the tricky part is organizations that want to do that don't want to appear biased. And, you know, media organizations that are reporting good information also are afraid of the accusation of bias. And when you have a lopsided reception and um, diffusion of disinformation between the parties, it makes it really difficult to sound like you're being fair and honest and open when what you're doing is dismissing arguments from, you know, the, the Republican president a, a year ago, or, you know, uh, and members of the Republican Party to this day that are in Congress and in power 
that are still arguing the big lie. And, and so that, I think that's one of the big challenges that we have is, is how to appear trustworthy when you are trustworthy without uh, activating the defenses against partisanship and bias that people have. Uh, and I think training early and you know, here's how you would detect it and here's our, some good sources would be effective. I think we should start, we're doing it in high school sometimes now or maybe until college if you take the class that includes it. But I think it should be an elementary school. You know, learn to read, learn to read news, learn to um, critically evaluate it. And there are actually some good organizations doing something like that. Fantastic, good organizations, including the one which you are a part of. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, turning towards more of a comparative perspective um, between the US, Russia, and of course its predecessor, the Soviet Union. Um, as Dr. Cohen points out, disinformation was often used by governments against their opponents and enemies abroad to establish conditions seemed favorable for said governments. Given that, and given the history of American efforts to foment anti-communist sentiment during the Cold War, can we view disinformation as something that modern governments view as useful for reinforcing domestic policy? Um, Dr. Cohen, would you like to take that first? Uh, yes. So, <laughs> uh, I, I guess, I. I'm not quite sure what the question is, but uh, I, I, can you repeat it for me? I'd be more than happy to. Just um, the last part. Of course, and you touched on this a little bit earlier um, about governments using disinformation as a tool. Um, do we believe that they are still doing that? Would you like to expand upon a little bit of that? Uh, yeah, well, definitely the Russian government is doing that. So if we want to talk about a specific case, I'm really not familiar with you know, US policies or other countries. That's not my area of expertise. I might have like a lay person's knowledge of this kind of thing. Uh, but uh, definitely the, the, uh, the Russian government itself seeks to promote disinformation within uh, Russia in the same way that it promotes disinformation outside. And uh, all of these policies are basically enabling the Putin government to sort of obscure its position within the country. So Russia is basically a country that has a constitution, it has a pluralist uh, public sphere, but it also has a sort of hidden oligarchy that's an official oligarchy that's controlled by uh, a relatively small number of people that pretty much operates extra constitutionally, right? And I would say often informally. Um, and so the goal of this elite, this sort of governing elite is to uh, have itself identified with the country, right? So any, that's why they try and mobilize Russian patriotism, right? Uh, and which they're mobilize, they're trying to mobilize legitimacy for themselves. So they want to obscure the difference between the ruling elite and the country, right? And make it impossible for you to criticize, they, they make it uh, impossible for you to criticize the ruling elite without criticizing the country. And so they use uh, social media, television to, and you might say official ideology to make this equivalency as well as foreign, the foreign stuff that we were talking about. And that's, that's where the disinformation comes in because it's obscuring, right? And confusing people as to the reality that this country actually is run by a small group of people in their own interests who are the richest people in the world, right? And they're, just to give you an example of the dis disinformation, many of you are familiar with the uh, Alexei Navalny Institute in, in, incident. And one thing that Navalny does is he exposes corruption among uh, governing officials and puts very entertaining YouTube videos out on them. And uh, he, he most, when he got arrested, when he, the day he went to Russia, he released the video on Putin's palace that you may have heard about uh, in which, uh, but Putin's palace, which is like, uh, I don't know, cost a billion dollars. And Putin himself may be the richest person in the world. He does, uh, and, and people are going around saying, 
uh, we've exposed Putin's palace and the media in the United States says uh, uh, Putin owns a $1 billion palace. And of course, Putin got on and said, I don't own that palace. I don't, it's just owned by a friend of mine. So, uh, you know, technically he doesn't own it. It's just been built for him using shell companies, cutouts, what we'd call beards, right? To hide the fact that he actually does own it. And he kind of does that same thing with all of the Russian political spectrum, hiding his own, well, mistakes, as well as his own role in basically sucking a large part of the wealth, right, out of Russian economy into his own pockets, as well as the pockets of the people that are there. So long story short, disinformation is very important in Russia to maintain, right, that confusion between who is really running things, where the money is really going, right? and uh, to uh, make it difficult to accuse Putin of anything concrete. Thank you, that was a fantastic explanation and I appreciate you going into the details of that a little bit. Um, so in terms of disinformation being a government tool, is there a way we can apply that to the modern United States? I'm gonna turn it to Dr. Nalder to um, address that. Uh, you know, ideally in a democracy, we don't use disinformation as a tool, right? Um, though I do, I, obviously we've had propaganda campaigns in the past and so forth, but it's not something we would want to see ideally. Uh, we did see, of course, the, the Trump establishment, the, the Trump campaign, Trumpists, uh, pushing this disinformation narrative, I mean, multiple disinformation narratives around climate change and and other, you know, questioning of science. Uh, you know, it goes it goes in so many different directions. But of course, around undermining faith in the in the elections and in the democracy. And you know, we're seeing that play out with with new limits on voting being implemented in many states. And the, the justification for that is, well, look at all the irregularities that happened in 2020, which didn't actually happen, right? And so you can use a, a lie can be used to further um, policy based on that lie. And, you know, if you look at polling data, it looks like a majority of Republicans, self-reported Republicans, say that they believe the election was stolen. I, I doubt that all of those people actually believe that. It's probably expressive uh, responding to some extent that they, they would prefer that to be the way the world was. And so that's why they answer that way. But many of them probably do believe it because of the media environments that they've been exposed to. And, you know, so to that extent, members uh, of Congress and, and state legislators and governors are using, are weaponizing that disinformation for their own ends that will help them stay in power and, uh, you know, kick out the votes or discourage the votes of people that might oppose that power. Thank you for that. And I specifically appreciate um, you, you differentiating between what would normally be expected of a true democracy versus some of the incidents we've seen in recent years. Um, so changing gears a little bit, um, Dr. Palermo um, previously um, talked about the topic of um, white supremacy in our history and how that is weaponized as well. Um, so do we feel that the machinery of white supremacy, so we're talking um, like institutional racism, for example, do they operate more on um, the principles of disinformation as we've previously de um, defined as disease, fog and lies or propaganda, um, which is a more just centrally asserted lie? Well, see that that's that's a I mean that, that's a very big question because it's not um, it's so disjointed and fragmented and siloed and um, people are getting all of this disinformation on their their tailored feeds right which is the so um, what what's going on is there's a there's a movement called the Boogaloo movement right and um, these guys are they want to bring on a race war. They're called accelerationists, and they're on they're the total white supremacists, right? And um, what it is, it's named the Boogaloo because it's this horrible movie from 1984 uh, was a sequel to a breakdance movie called uh, Electric Boogaloo Two, right? And what they mean by that is this 
sequel is to the Civil War, is what they want, the sequel. And so, and, and then they also call it the Big Luau, they wear the um, Hawaiian shirts, like they did when they went to Michigan and took the state house with arms. You saw some of those guys wearing Hawaiian sh suit, you know, shirts, that's the, um, the Big Luau, but they're, they're calling for a race war, right? And so, I mean, Charles Manson called for a race war. I mean, this is madness, right? This is absolutely, and, and the Nazis, you know, what they've done to our discourse is they've, they've coarsened it so much by repeating things that we would never say to one another in person or in, in public behind the scenes where anybody who cares about social justice in this country or racism or anything is just a social justice warrior and they're just virtue signaling and the liberals are all just, you know, and we got to own them. And, and so, and then they also, they talk about lampshading George Soros and stuff. We're going to lampshade him. And these kinds of things. Now, these are things nobody would say, but online on these platforms, these right-wing platforms, they're seeing the openly Nazi stuff, right? And they're all over the place. And, and so now it's just considered like Anthony Fauci, for instance, the, the epidemiologist, right? He was getting death threats, right? For what? What did he do? But it's just kind of a, a, you know, it's a normal thing now that if you come out and you're against these, the right wing targets you, they could dox you, they'll send you rape and death threats. And that's all normalized now. That's just given. Like if you are a, a, a person, I, in other words, I think the discourse is so polluted. And then the big problem um, is epistemological where they, people think they know uh, the ways of knowing have changed, right? Uh, and so we, we don't know truth. Like um, Voltaire has a famous quote about those who can make you um, believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And then uh, Walter Lippmann also said years ago, something to the effect of, um, you know, no society de deserves liberty if they've lacked the ability to tell truth from lies, right? And I think that's where we're at. And I, I would just urge people to try to think, what is this going to look like in 2031 on this trajectory that we're on? And those voter suppression laws um, that Professor Nalder mentioned uh, that the state level the Republicans are putting through, they're all done under this, this fig leaf of that big lie that, oh, we need, we need these laws for election security when in reality, they're aimed at suppressing the votes of African Americans primarily, but uh, people of color, young people, people who generally in urban areas who vote um, democratic. And so there's a voter suppression. This is gonna have real effects on our democracy. And I think it's going to work. I'm telling you now as an American historian that the Republicans are gonna win the house in 2022. And if they don't, I'll buy you all a Coke, okay? But they're gonna win, it's gonna work. They might win the Senate too. And then, they're, then, oh, it worked. They're going to double down on it like they always do. But they're going to win the House in 2022 with these lies based on this big lie and the, the suppression, et cetera, in my opinion. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through that again. It's a very, it's a very important topic, especially these days. Um, so turning back to um, the issue of media and uh, media accountability, so to speak, um, I'm going to turn to Dr. Nalder and ask, um, so how do we hold the media accountable um, for supplying verifiably true information? And we also got an additional question as to who determines true information or how do we determine um, factually correct information? Yeah, those are tough questions. Uh so the determination of factually accurate information is really challenging for, you know, there are lots of fact-checking organizations, factcheck.org, PolitiFact, et cetera, uh, linked with media organizations most of the time that, that try to do that work. And, and one of the things that they always run up against is um, folks disbelieving whatever they put out. And we found that with the, the fact checks we've done on campaign ads, where we'll post them on social media and then see who, who uh, retweets it or, you know, shares it or whatever. And it's usually the people who, whose uh, opponent has been fact-checked, right? It's, it's not the people who need to hear that information that like maybe their candidate lied or something like that. 
And so that's one of the real challenges with, with fact checking, one of the reasons that it, it's not always effective. Um, in, in some of uh, our research, we found that the fact checking can be, presenting fact checking information can be effective in correcting people's perceptions within parties, so during primaries. So there's a little bit of hope there. Um, but, the, but the bigger question about, you know, media, what can media be, do to culturally deprogram or what needs to be done to culturally deprogram and what can media do? Um, we need curation, I think. You know, we have, it's just a fire hose of, of information that's coming at us. And having folks who can sort of uh, direct us to good information that we trust and I think one of the natural places for that to happen would be libraries. Uh, there's not a, a partisan bias to libraries. That, that perception hasn't taken root yet, at least. And you know, so so libraries could be uh, a trusted source for that kind of information. Um, but the, the the deprogramming would require us to to quit thinking of each other in demonized ways. We've, we've seen that ramped up over the last several decades especially and that demonization makes it permissible to do all sorts of horrible things and accuse people of horrible things i mean if you think about the the pizzagate conspiracy just the idea that people would believe that hillary clinton was capable of doing something like that like it's insane but but the gall of it and the 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 cynicism that's there uh, I, I would love for us to teach or you know, sort of empathy and compassion and realism uh, in in our schools um, to deal with that. So I have not answered the question of how how we make it uh, better in terms of the media because I don't think there's an easy answer to it. But I think there are lots of people at least trying to do it. I'd agree. There's definitely not an easy answer, but we've taken part in the discussion, which is part of finding the answer. That is for sure. Um, so, speaking of speech and journalists and turning a little bit to social media, um, I'm going to turn to uh, maybe Dr. Palermo will have some thoughts on this as well as Dr. Nalder. Um, so, should we hold social media companies responsible for their content on their platforms? Um, and our moderator, Dr. Edinger, recently mentioned um, running up against First Amendment rights as well. How do we view all these things, um, especially in the context of history? Social media is a new tool of the 21st century. I'm Dr. Palermo. Okay, well, yeah, I think these platforms would have to, they would have to change their business models because their business, business models right now all revolve around uh, culling what they call digital exhaust, which is basically everything you've clicked on, everything you've searched, everything you've watched. And they have these um, machine learning tools that are high powered computers that will immediately go to these advertisers that will immediately target you with advertising and they get a cut off of that, right? And so their whole business model really um, depends on by selling your da our data, like our personal private data. And there's this big, you know, those big terms of um, agreement things that they make you click on once and nobody reads them, but in the small print, it says we could do anything we want with your data. And, and their whole business model, um, I, I believe it, that, I don't think antitrust would work necessarily, but they'd have to have um, some gatekeepers and they do that a little bit. I mean, they, they'll kick some Nazis off um, here and there, but um, they have to be m much more, uh, we can't leave it in the hands of Google and, and Zuckerberg to do the right thing because it, it, they don't have any financial incentive to do the right thing. It would have to be some kind of, not a filter, but at least a, a gatekeeper that um, they, they it, it looks like they're moving in that direction if you're, um, advocating violence, but they probably should um, make that more robust. Um, and if you're advocating the big lie of that Trump won the election, at least in the corporate media, the television shows, when some of these big shots go on, they will say, do you, do you agree that Biden won legitimately? And then they'll hem and haw and everything. But at least there are people in the corporate media, you know, that are trying to keep the, that record straight, but it's not, it's not working. There's still about 70 million people probably out there who think that Trump won. 
and they're voters and they're active and they're not going away. And so, in other words, the damage is kind of done, I think, to our, um, our ability to discern truth from falsehood now. And there, there are no easy solutions, but a place to start would be the business models of the platforms themselves. Uh, can I talk? I just wanted to continue what Joe was saying just really quickly that I agree with him. I think that we often assume that social media space is same as sort of physical public space, that it's kind of a neutral place where things go and are kind of neutrally consumed. But it's really important, something we haven't talked about is to note how it's part of a business model and it's designed to increase business for certain people and in certain ways. And therefore, if you can control the space, either through technical means or um, uh, moderator, means of moderators, you probably can minimize a lot of the damage of social media disinformation. You know, it's very difficult, right? Because people have to want to do that. And there's a lot of money made from this and a lot of political capital that's built through this system. And so, but I think technically it's okay. It's, uh, it's doable. All right, I'll well, just, go, ahead. go ahead, Kim, please. Oh, I just wanted to say that the, 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 media, the, the business model needs to change. And again, the defamation suits, I think, are, are a, a, a step in the right direction. I had a couple months ago, Fox News used a clip from a PI initiative explainer from 2016 in a story about uh, sexual offenders getting out on parole early in California. And the way they framed it and the way they uh, the voiceover was made it look like me and the audience were laughing at lax rules for sex offenders, which feeds into the QAnon conspiracy. And it was infuriating, but there's really nothing I can do about it, right? I, I can't really bring a defamation lawsuit because it doesn't meet the criteria. I, you know, I talked to several people and nobody said that, that I could have a case or anything like that. But if we strengthen some of those laws where misleading information can get you in financial trouble, maybe that's a step towards an answer. All right, I'm gonna step in here. I wanna thank Karita for leading us through the Q&A. It's not easy to take uh, 30 or 40 questions and try and distill them down to, uh, to engage the panelists, but I think she did a fantastic job. Um, and actually, I think um, I'm just going to um, bring this to an end by thanking our panelists. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, hearing your thoughts and I appreciate uh, the time and thought that everybody brought to this. Um, I believe that this um, will be posted uh, to the um, department's YouTube page at some point. So if you wanna share this with somebody, that and, will and the be... pie page too. We'll put it up on oh. ours as well. Yes, and the pie page as well. Thank you. And um, but again, thank you very much to all the panelists for their time. And um, I hope you guys have a good weekend. <laughs>